Thank you very much. That's the uh, the heartbeat of the Poconoka tribe. And uh, so glad to see you braved your way here. And uh, I tell you, after uh, after you get your clothes dried, <laughs> you'll feel a lot better. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the, rain, the, the rain is on its way out, right? <laughs> uh, well. I'm Dave Weed. Uh, I'm probably the reason uh, we're doing this, so if you want to blame somebody, I'm the guy. <laughs> but I didn't want to pass up a, uh, an opportunity to celebrate something that you can only do uh, once every 400 years. And today's the day, okay? Um, this is the fourth anniversary of the arrival of uh, Ed Winslow and Stephen Hopkins, who walked 42 miles uh, from Plymouth to somewhere probably within a few hundred yards of where we are now, and had the, the very first meeting with the Massasoit at his home. Uh, so what, uh, what you're seeing here is a recreation of that event uh, 400 years ago. And more importantly, a reminder of the importance of that meeting. Okay? Uh, we'll be talking a little bit in more detail, but I don't want to take a lot of time on that. You can read that story. Uh, it's uh, all over the internet now. Uh, but basically, it was the beginning of a friendship that lasted for over 40 years. And had that friendship not taken place, I doubt any of us would be here. Okay. And, uh, there's a good chance that uh, the Narragansetts would have moved into the area, sent the English packing, and uh, I don't know, we'd be Canadian, French, or Algonquin, or something, but we wouldn't be where we are today. So I'm going to turn the mic over uh, to the sachem of the tribe uh, and uh, Dancing Star, uh, and she's going to just say a couple words of welcome from the tribe. So 400 years ago, the ambassadors Winslow and Hopkins journeyed to the land of Poconocet. They came to see the great leader of the Poconocet. They came right here in Selwams, the homeland of the Poconocet tribe. And so on behalf of the Tribal Council, on behalf of the Poconoket people, on behalf of myself, Popomokwakanakis, 11th generation great-granddaughter of the Massasoit Osamequin, welcome all of you, as our ancestors did, to the ancestral homeland of the Poconoket tribe. Imagine, imagine what it would be like if the terms of the treaty were still being honored today. That would be amazing. But we can't rewind the clock. We can't go back in history. But what we can do is we can honor the spirit of the treaty. We can make sure that the parties of that treaty are afforded the same privileges, the same opportunities. We can make sure that those parties are equally respected as a people, that they are acknowledged 
and that they are listened to. Events like this are wonderful because we need to know our history and we need to tell others about that history. In Warren, you have a shared history with the Poconoka people and it is a rich, wonderful history. So this is great, this is great. And I just want, and I just want to thank everyone who made this possible, everyone who has helped in whatever way, for all of you here today, for everyone who came out in this weather, I thank you on behalf of our people, Tabotney. Well, the, uh, the Massachusetts welcome uh, extended to members of both uh, the Winslow uh, uh, leader who came here and the uh, uh, Stephen Hopkins family. And we have representatives from both of those families here. Well, I'd just like to say that I have, um, I descend not from Edward, um, but from his brothers Nelm and Josiah Winslow. So my ancestry goes all the way back, but Edward would be uh, an uncle. Also, I'd like to say that as a person who is now 400 years descendant from those two original Winslows, I also have a po Poconocket, uh, not Poconocket, but a Pothenomaquet Indian line. And so I'm standing here as native on one side and colonial on the other. I don't look like it, but I definitely am. And, and I feel it every day. I have a master's degree in Native New England functional art forms, and I've always been fascinated by the Native New England people. In my master's degree program, I still didn't know that I was a part of Namaquit on the outer cape. Probably the smallest little band of Indians there were tribes under Massasoit, we were probably the smallest one and the first one erased because my ancestors such as John Howland and John uh, Alden, they took over the land on the Outer Cape and so the Indians were put on reservations really early and the only reason why I found out about this was just by accident when I was 65, I, I finally found a document that connected me with those people. And then I understood why I've been studying Native Americans all my life. Um, but anyway, welcome and I'm very happy to see so many people disregarding what you feel like today just to come out and to stand here with us my friend from... Yeah, good. This is Susan Abnor. She, she came up, she drove up here from Manhattan today uh, just to be here. And uh, she has a long history of travel and once things dry out a little bit, we'll get you her story that's all written there about her trip from Plymouth to Warren in 2013. In 2005, I founded a society for the descendants of Pilgrim, uh, this, uh, Pilgrim Hopkins Heritage Society for the descendants of Stephen Hopkins and his two wives. In 2013, I and my family made a walk that Hopkins and Winslow took that we are celebrating today. Um, there's an article in the Society, Hopkins Society website that, uh, about that reenactment. And just to let you know how hard that walk was, I lost all my toenails. <laughs> Stephen Hopkins first came to America in 1610 to settle Jamestown, and that was his first inter interaction with the Algonquin people and their language. Um, in 1620, he came to Plymouth on the Mayflower in, in hopes of settling. 
as the only person with knowledge of the Algonquin culture and language, he could serve as ambassador and peacemaker. Stephen Hopkins had great courage. Um, for example, on the 17th of February, 1621, um, two Wampanoag men appeared on Watson's Hill across from Town Brook. Um, and Stephen Hopkins and Miles Standish um, went to meet them as first emissaries. Hopkins was unarmed and Standish carried a musket. Um, as Hopkins and Sanders approached and set aside the musket partway up the hill, the Wampanoags disappeared, and from behind the crest of the hill, a loud cry with many warriors was heard all the way back to the fort. That day, there was no more interaction. Samoset was the first emissary to, uh, sent by Massasoit to the colony of Plymouth. He arrived at the fort unannounced on the 16th of March, saying, Hello, Englishmen. At, that, at the end of the day, he didn't want to leave, so he lodged with the Hopkins family. Um, on the 17th of March, he left, presumably, uh, to send a message to Massasoit, and then returned the same day, and stayed in the colony until the 21st of March. This was a turning point in the relationship between the colony and the Wampanoag nation. Samoset arrived back in the colony the next day and brought Squanto, um, a Pawtucket native, who lived in London, about nine minutes walk from where Hopkins had lived. On the 22nd of March, Massasoit arrived with 60 Wampanoag warriors in Pawtucket, Plymouth, Plymouth to sign a treaty. William Bradford, the governor of the colony, chose 40-year-old Stephen Hopkins and 26-year-old Edward Winslow to make the journey to visit Massasoit in this place that we now call Warren, Rhode Island. The courage of these two men helped solidify a peace that lasted for decades. Thank you very much. There's, there's a quite a story here. A reading from uh, Nathaniel Philbrick's Mayflower. And if you liked a little bit you hear today, I highly recommend that you read the entire book uh, sometimes. So we had the, uh, Philbrick down here for a book signing this, this last Sunday. So uh, I'll turn it over to Rock for the opening. By the beginning of July, Bradford determined that they should send a delegation to visit their new friend, Massasoit. They had not, as of yet, had an opportunity to explore the interior of the surrounding countryside, and it was time they made their presence known beyond Plymouth and Cape Cod. On July 2nd, Edward Winslow and Stephen Hopkins left the settlement, and around 9 a.m., the spawn of the crowd. Besides some gifts for Massasoit, a copper chain and a red cotton horseman's coat. They carried their muskets and a cooked partridge for sustenance. Sounds good. They soon came upon a dozen men, women, and children who were returning to Namaskin after gathering lobsters in Plymouth Harbor. One of the countless seasonal rituals that kept the Indians constantly on the move. As they conversed with their new companions, the Englishmen learned that to walk across the land in southern New England was to travel in time. All along this narrow, hard-packed trail were circular foot-feet holes in the ground that had been dug where any remarkable act had occurred. It was each person's responsibility to maintain the holes and to inform fellow travelers of what had once happened at that particular place so that many things of great antiquity are fresh in memory. Winslow and Hopkins began to see that they were traversing a mythic land where a sense of community extended far into the distant past. So that as a man traveleth, Winslow wrote, his journey will be less tedious by reason of the many historical discourses that will be related unto him. Everywhere they went, they were stunned by the emptiness and desolation of the place. Thousands of men have lived there, Winslow wrote which died in a great plague not long since, and a pity it was and is to see so many goodly fields and so well seated without men to
to dress and manure the same. At Namaskit, Middleborough, they enjoyed a meal of cornbread, herring roe, and boiled acorns. Squanto suggested that they push on another few miles before nightfall to give themselves enough time to reach Bukanakit in the next day. Around sunset, Winslow and Hopkins reached a spot on the river where the Indians had built a weir and were harvesting striped bass. That night, they lodged in the open fields. The grassy fields and open forests were, in Winslow's words, like many places in England. They came upon other Indians along the way, but all grew friendly, and before the day was over, they reached Massachusetts village known as Soans. As the sun reached its height, the traveling became quite hot, and their companions cheerfully offered to carry their guns and extra clothing for them. The grassy plains and open grassy fields and open forests were, in Winslow's words, like many places in England. In the, year, in the years to come, as the pilgrims began to purchase land from Okanokan and Sachem, they spoke of Solomon as the Garden of the Payton, a fertile sweep of land with two rivers providing, providing easy access to near a cancer bed. As anyone could plainly see, Massasoit was positioned as, at a place that made Plymouth seem, by comparison, a remote and hilly wasteland. The Massasoit invited them into his dwelling, where they presented him with the proper chain to bolster his coat. Winslow reported that once the Massasoit had put on the coat and chain around his neck, he was not a little too proud to see himself and his men to see their king so bravely attired. Indeed, the Ma Massasoit of Pokemokit appeared to have been pleasantly surprised by Winslow and Hopkins' appearance and readily agreed to all the pilgrims requested. The Massasoit gathered his people around him and began to deliver a long and exuberant speech. Was not he, Massasoit, commander of the country about him? This he proclaimed. He spoke of the many villages and people that paid him tribute and how those villages would all trade with the pilgrims. With the naming of each place, his men responded with a refrain about Massasoit's power over the villages, how these people would be at peace with the English and provide them with furs. By arriving unannounced, Winslow and Hopkins had unintentionally placed Massasoit in a difficult and potentially embarrassing situation. He was happy, even ecstatic, to see them, but he had no food to offer. It was getting late, and it was now clear to the pilgrims that there was nothing for them to eat, so they asked to go to bed. Much to their surprise, the sachem insisted that they share the wigwam sleeping platform with himself and his wife, they at one end and we at the other. What's more, two of Massasoit's warriors crowded onto the platform with them. That night, neither Winslow nor Hopkins slept the wind. The next day, Winslow and Hopkins challenged some of them to a shooting contest. Early that afternoon, Massasoit returned with two large striped bass. The fish were quickly boiled. It was the first meal Winslow and Hopkins had eaten in two nights and a day. Their second night at Solmes proved to be as sleepless as the first. Even before sunrise, the two Englishmen decided that, the, that they'd best be on their way. We much fearing, Winslow wrote, that if we should stay any longer, we should not be able to recover home for want of strength. The Massasoit was both grieved and ashamed that he could build that land of the country. But that did not prevent the visit from ending on a most positive note. Two days later, on the main of Saturday, July 7th, after a solid day of rain, uh, Winslow and Hopkins arrived back at Plymouth. They were wet, weary, footsore, and famished, but they had succeeded in strengthening their settlement's ties with the Massasoit and the Indians to the west. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farmer. This, this is their, their debut. If you'd like them to appear at uh, an event of yours, uh, you can talk to their agent. Uh, 
so uh, as you recall, part of the story had to do with uh, an exchange of gifts. Uh, and in particular, uh, one gift that had special significance, and that was a copper chain necklace that was given by Ed Winslow to the Massasoit for a particular reason. That was so that if the Massasoit had something he wanted to say to the English of Plymouth, he could give the necklace to a warrior who would take that with the message so that the English would know that that was not a counterfeit message. Uh, so it was a, a way of securing uh, the... Uh, it's uh, um, an equivalent to what we try to do with our modern communication, okay, uh, to make sure it's not compromised. So, uh, yeah, would you come up, Sagamore? Just <laughs> so, um, Sagamore, I'm so, so proud to be here standing with you. This is like a lifelong dream. So, when I painted the painting of Massasoit, I, I did it according to the history and, and whatever research I could do for each part of that painting. Now, here's a picture of it from, say, 10 years ago. And you can see, even though my, my ink turned his face pink today, that the chain that's around his neck was a chain link. And that was just me trying to solve the problem of what this chain looked like. It was not until I met Dave Wee and Dave shared a picture of the real chain. I mean, I almost fell over. But here it is. It's not a chain link. It is copper beads, right? What does it say about this? Just, just so you know, uh, Virginia Baker, who is Baker Street, she used to live right on this street, okay? And she's the one who is largely responsible for the Massapoit Spring that when you get a chance, <laughs> you could go back there and, and look at. But uh, you know that the uh, Burr's Hill was a burial site, the royal burial site for the tribe. And uh, we're certain that the Massasoit itself was, was buried there initially, then taken and, and reburied. But when his grave was dug up, they found this copper chain that was in his grave, and it went to, of course, the heaven record. But it should be back there now. It should have been reburied. So in order for me to paint it, I had to find a chain that was just like it because that photograph is just in black and white and I could tell some things but I wanted to really see a copper chain. Well, I found one in Ethiopia and I set away for it and I used it to paint that painting of Massasoit. And I want you to have this copper chain with the charm on it that I used to paint Massasoit's chain. Dave says we are a lot of us. <laughs> well, I am truly honored to be able to this. I've done a lot of research. I am really a speechless. I've been doing good things. This is a 400 year apology for all the things that should never have happened. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
there's a full hall cell over there and uh, some red cedar and uh, some clips from the top top the sea of the basses and that's all I want to do and uh, I'm honored to be here today uh, uh, and, and uh, this is a chance for us to write, to write the history and uh, you know uh, there are uh, at one time this area here was considered popular. But uh, you have a rich history there. Don't let people see the history. The fact that the Massasoit was here in Swartz, he was ahead of the largest Indian nation, not the biggest five, Arrogance is but the total information was larger than nations in this area. Coconuts, rhythm songs, don't forget that. It wasn't a rock and roll because rock and roll was a term that didn't come into being until during the King Philip War, 1675, 1676. The Massasoit would have never recognized the term rock and roll. And that's something that needs to be corrected also. Uh, these historians have taken a lot of liberties, trying to rock our history, and uh, uh, these revisionists who are themselves limited. We do not find their pride be the mental. So when we talk about, and that is why in 2015 we took back the term Pocanoka, which is what this whole area was known as, Pocanoka country, when the English came here. And any map prior to the King Philip War we'll said right on it, Pocanoka country or King Philip country. So that's, that's what needs to be done. We visit this, we're still trying to do that. But anything I do with the, uh, with the government, so we're not a Pocanoke Nation. Pocanoke Nation. The tribe was the headship tribe of the Pocanoke Nation. Pocanoke the Confederacy. It wasn't a lot of North Confederacy. And I, that's something that needs to be done. And I want to thank <laughs> you.